Hello guys and welcome to this presentation for just Disability Arts Online about finding your voice. I am unapologetically Quilly Coley. I am a creative writer, poet, mother, wife, activist and retired council worker. I was born with mild cerebral palsy in India and moved to England at a very early age. I now live with my family of three children, a husband and in-laws in Wolverhampton and I've worked for Wolverhampton Council for 32 years. That was from 1989 to 2021. I will be sharing with you today how I progressed from a diary writer and scribbler to becoming a published poet. The steps that were taken of finding a mentor and joining a writing group which finally led to me fi finding my voice. Now poetry has been a very important aspect for me for expressing myself personally, emotionally and getting the people around me to realise that there is somebody sensitive in living in my body. I was born with mild cerebral palsy and throughout my childhood and teenage years I was ashamed of myself. I wanted to be normal all the time but I didn't know myself what normal was. I've had a passion for writing since childhood, writing has opened all kinds of possibilities for me as I struggle to express myself because of my disability. Having the ability to write has made my life more rewarding and richer. And sharing your voice and views to complete strangers can be a very scary process but also a very rewarding one. At first I was petrified. I used to think that I could not speak in front of, on, a, on a stage and I used to ask my friends to speak on my behalf because I thought people would laugh at me and not want to see me struggling with my speech on the stage. However, I was given a lot of encouragement and guidance and support by my mentors and family of po poets and writers. I began to perform more to different audiences and slowly, slowly I began to enjoy it because I could see my work was making an impression. I think performing is important because it, because it gives the audience a feel of what the poet and why and what drives them to write. When I sit down on a stage to read my poetry, there's a sudden silence in the room. When I get when I when I get going, the audience start to relax and start to enjoy my poetry 
and by the end of the performance, the audience have fallen in love with me. The audience genuinely are interested in hearing my poetry and stories. Now my pamphlet patchwork and my full collection a Wonder Woman are published by Office Press. I now run the Punjabi Women Writing Group, which was set up in June 2018. This writing group is dedicated to all women of South Asian heritage who live in Wolverhampton and the West Midlands. Over the last few years, we have had successful writing workshops and local performances in Wolverhampton and Iron Bridge that have sparked up a lot of interest. I have performed my, my work in West Midlands and universities in London, Berlin and Liverpool. I write a regular blog for Disability Arts Online. I've also performed at the British Museum in London at the Purple Light e event celebrating International Disabled Persons Day 2019. In 2020, my life story was featured on BBC News Online and read over 1.7 million people and I appeared on BBC One's Sunday morning live show. I have been appointed Poet Laureate of the City of Wolverhampton 2022-2024. I'm involved in various projects around the country. I've read my, my poem on Poetry Please on Radio BBC Radio 4 and in April 2022 I was conferred upon to receive an honorary degree of Doctors of Letters by the University of Wolverhampton. Now that's a lot of things that have happened over the last 10, 12 years and I just want to say that if I can do that, do this, so can you. You, you if you write, if you are an, an artist, if you want to share your voice, I, I urge you to do it. Please do it. Please do. Now, I'm going to share with you a poem which was my first pub pub publication in 2010. It was the first poem I wrote when I joined Blake and Hall Writers in the, and I did it in the first session. And it's in my book here, Patchwork. So here's mine. Mine. I have a dream. Please don't influence it. It belongs to me. I have a delicate heart. 
Please don't break it. It belongs to me. I have peace of mind. Please don't disturb it. It belongs to me. I have to follow a path. Please don't obstruct it. It belongs to me. I have an amazing life. Please let me live it. It belongs to me. I have freedom. Please don't capture me. It belongs to me. I have incredible feelings. Please don't hurt me. They belong to me. I have a lot of love. Please don't hate me. Love is mine to share. I am on my material journey. Don't follow me. It won't be fair. So, I have a dream. And it's my dream to be free. Thank you. The rag doll. To fellow rag dolls, living with terrible palsy. Silk, linen, velvet, cotton, wool. Made from wool for textured fabrics, buttons, ribbons, hips made from zips, whoops a daisy and fall into bits. Her heart is made of golden fluff, her smile stitched shining light. Now and again she's not there quite, her spirit shines like ultraviolet light. Droops, dangles, her limbs and neck, durable to all types of wear and tear, broken, damaged, here and there. People stare, she just does not care. Battling, juggling impossibilities, shining diamond sequined eyes, always ready to give you a surprise. Like a cartoon, she'll always survive. Past trouble with her physical being, words tangled in the laces of her head, still figuring out what you have just said, jerking, jolting to the day she's dead. This is an extract of Dangerous Games. Chenille was an ordinary British Asian Sikh girl with a difference. She had been born with a slight disability, cerebral palsy. Her disability did not exactly stop her from doing things. It just made her feel like she was not able, making her somewhat lazy. She walked awkwardly, appearing very clumsy and unstable. Many people she met on the streets thought she was drunk or on drugs. Her parents and family were supporting and overprotective of her. All her life, she had been kept in a comfort zone, but she had not been spoiled. She knew her father had loved her very much, especially during her childhood. Her father would sit up for, with her for hours, praying to God in the hope that his daughter would be cured of her disability. She had a good family and loving relatives. The most important factor the family lacked was the ability to communicate and interact as a family. With everyone working or at school, there was never any time to discuss the day's activities or problems with one another. By the time evening fell, Mr and Mrs Dillon were so tired they just about had the energy to eat their evening meal and go to bed, leaving the children up to their own devices. Chenille was born in northeast India, in the state of Uttaranjal in a little village called Karajoti, at the foot of the Himalayas near the river Ganges. She was a firstborn child to her parents. Her parents were married just nine months before Chenille was born. It was a cold Tuesday, 8 December, 1970, the day she was born. All relatives gathered around D Dylan's clay house in anticipation waiting for their first grandson to arrive. When they realised a girl had been born, 
All the planned celebrations diffused into a saddened atmosphere. This little baby was not a normal baby. She had a thick layer of yellow jaundice covering her tiny, skinny body. Her grandmother tried to wash off the colour, assuming it was just the colour of her skin. But she, but she moved very awkwardly with uncontrollable spasms. Nobody knew what was wrong with her. There were no doctors in the village, and even the non-medically trained midnight bit midwife, Adesi Dai, did not know what was wrong with the newborn child. Priti, her mother, was only sixteen years old and was unaware of the f- of what to expect and to do after childbirth. She had to accept everyone's word for it. There was so much sorrow and distress on the day that Chanel was born. The day the baby was born with so much negativity in the villagers' eyes, giving her mother no enthusiasm to look after her alien-like child. As the news sped around the village, relatives came to witness the strange baby, cursing her, saying all kinds of ter- terrible things about the newborn and her mother. Oh my goodness, what has she given birth to? That new bride from Punjab has not brought the family any luck, has she? What kind of kismet has she has she come to with the Dillon household? That child is not a child, but a burden and an unnecessary weight to the family. Our poor son, Gurdiv, will have to live with such a woman who produces such alien-like children. Her mother had hoped to be happy in her marriage. This child had brought nothing but guilt, sadness and depression upon her. Throw it into the river. Nobody will want to marry it when it grows up. You won't even notice after a couple of weeks that you've ever had it. You'll have more children, hopefully better than that one. So you must look forward to them. Just imagine all the distress you'll have to live with if you keep it. Just think you've had a miscarriage and you'll be okay. They, adm- they advised her mother. With this negative attitude, the family and friends were pressing on. Her mother almost threw her little helpless child away like a piece of rubbish. Society and culture had her believing all these lies about her baby. She almost hated and neglected this child for being born to her. This was the way of life in the uneducated villages of India. It was common for mothers to discard their newborn children if they did not want to keep them, especially if it was female and was born abnormally like Chanel. It was her father who spoke, saying, No, nobody's touching my daughter. She is a part of me, could dev sing. God has given her to me for a reason. I will respect the will of God. Nobody will do or say anything bad to my baby or Preeti, my wife. I hope I have made myself clear. Her name is Chanel Kaur Dillon, he proudly announced. Gurdiv had returned from England to marry and settle back home in India after living and working in England for five hard years. He was the oldest of two sons and three daughters. He wanted to stay in India to cultivate and develop his many acres of land which belonged to his father. He would be entitled to inherit a share of land after his father's death. All the family took turns to take care of Chanel until she was a year and a half old. She could not walk or talk and was very slow at picking things up. People still did not know what was medically wrong with her. Her neck dangled like a rag doll. She could not support her head at all. Her awkward movements came like electric pulses waving her limbs, limb like puppets. Preeti asked her husband, when can we go from here? This is not our home. Our home is where you came from in England. Preeti repeated this mantra day after day like a stubborn child. Please must, please we must get out of India. Your dad is in England, so why can't we go to live with him there? This village is really making me ill. Preeti visualised a perfect life in England full of glorious things and saintly people. Believe me. Our life is meant to be in England. Just think your chenille might get better over there and we can take her to the doctors and get her checked and seen to and she will get well. Preeti finally convinced her husband to believe she was right and she was wrong to live in India. It was not, her, it was not only her dream and admission, but many of the people in India longed to live abroad and migrate to the Western world for a better quality of life. Then in, no- 70- then in 1972, Chanel and her parents, along with her grandfather, arrived in the heart of England, the black country, to begin to live their perfect life. As time had gone by, Chanel began to learn and grow up. She realised that the world around her was not like the world she had lived in for the first 20 years of her life. 
The thought of this made her want to go out and explore, but this was virtually impossible for her. The protection from her family and the limitations her disability caused were the main reasons she could not explore the world. During her years of schooling, she had not been able to walk to and from school because she and the other students with disabilities had to be escorted by taxi for their own safety as well as the school's insurance policy to protect their vulnerable students from any harm. Many of the children at the school thought she was very lucky getting a taxi, but to her it had been like a prison sentence. She longed to walk with her friends and do the things that normal children did, like going to detours and getting involved with other children and messing about at the back of the school. At this inquisitive stage, her ordinary Asian lifestyle began to change. What follows is an introduction to Cooley at a Lunch Like the Queen event at Wolverhampton Art Gallery, read by a man in a ceremonial gown. Madam Mayor, ladies and gentlemen, Cooley Coley was born in India with cerebral palsy and now she lives in Wolverhampton and is married with three children. After working 32 years for the City of Wolverhampton Council, she is now retired and runs the Punjabi Women's Writing Group. Her pamphlet, Patchwork, and her full poetry collection, A Wonder Woman, published by Opus Press, has been widely admired, and she also writes to Disability Arts Online. She has performed her work at universities in London, Berlin, Liverpool, and also the British Museum for the Purple Light Up event celebrating International Disabled Persons Day in 2019. In 2020, Cooley's life story was featured on BBC News Online and was featured on BBC One Sunday Morning Live Show. This year, she has been appointed Poet Laureate of the City of Wolverhampton in 2022. <laughs> Her poetry has been read on Poetry Please on BBC Radio 4 and last month she was conferred upon to receive an honorary degree of Doctor of Letters by the University of Wolverhampton.